Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Johnson with, uh, with Delta Ward Data Solutions and we really appreciate you guys spending the, uh, the morning and the day with us here today. Um, we got a lot of really uh, we had a lot of really fun, uh, uh, fun events going on today, some great giveaways and some really good speakers. So we're excited to, uh, to have you guys here for that. Um, we have uh, Steve Foskett that's going to be kicking off the, uh, the morning uh, keynote. A lot of you may know him from uh, uh, Tech Field Day and uh, other speaking endeavors and his blogging and Twitter and, uh, and those types of things. And we're really excited to have him. And uh, why don't you come on out whenever you're sure. ready, Steve? <laughs> Thank you. I just picked that guy at random. Hey, I get applause? Don't tell my wife. All right. She thinks these things are all about just having fun and drinking anyway, so we'll, uh, oh man, look at this, Microsoft Auto Update just decided to run. Again, I'm glad that you all are IT folks because you're all just like, oh yeah, Microsoft Auto Update? Totally. Anyway, hello, good morning everybody. Morning. Morning. Awesome, so my wife is a high school teacher and so, um, and uh, she's learned the uh, good morning, everybody. And you apparently are all also high school students because everybody said good morning. That's awesome. I'm supposed to say, what's good about it? All right, so it's great to be back here. I, I, love, I love this event. Um, uh, thank you very much for in including me. Um, this has always been a lot of fun. I gotta say, one of the cool things about, about Deltaware is that they seem kind of like nerds like me. And I really appreciate that about them. Um, you know, sometimes you know you, you're, you're dealing with these people, and a lot of what you're uh, a lot of what you're dealing with is like you know sell, sell, sell. What's on the truck? Um, I know these guys geek out, um, and that's cool. As mentioned, um, uh, you know, so I, I do a lot of this uh, you know speaking. Um, I run something called Tech Field Day, which uh, has anybody anybody heard of Tech Field Day? Okay, good, we've got some, oh, well, I know, oh, okay, we got ringers, we got ringers, okay, yeah. Didn't even see you there, buddy. Um, so Tech Field Day is an event where people like me and David here and Scott Lowe and James Green, and I think that's all the delegates in the room, but we get together with uh, companies that are uh, doing cool tech, and we talk tech with them. We spend a few hours with them talking about how their products work. And we put it on the internet, wide open, for free, no registration, whatever. So um, I'd love you guys to, to, to check it out. If you enjoy the kind of, the kind of presentations you're going to see here today, then you would probably love Tech Field Day, too. So that's my pitch. I'll just say that right now. Um, and I'm also into all sorts of other things. Um, hopefully, you saw something in there that you like. Um, and one thing I don't like, though, is PowerPoint. We were talking about that this morning. Um, I, I get so sick of PowerPoint. I hate PowerPoint. So I do a little something a little different here, and you're going to see it here in a minute. Um, I don't go in for all those flashy graphics and builds. Um, our, our esteemed AV guy, thank you so much, offering audio. No. <laughs> no audio. No flying things. No builds. I want you to feel like we went to the Good Earth this morning, which I love, by the way. That's like my favorite place in Minneapolis, and, and had breakfast. And you said, "Hey, Stephen, I know you go out to all these events, and I know you, you were at Docker, you know, a couple months ago. So, Stephen, what's the deal with containers anyway?" And I pulled, I flipped over the placemat and got out a pen, and that's why all my graphics look like that. So hopefully you guys will, will bear with me with that. So, so what is the deal with containers? Um, it seems like it's everywhere right now. I mean, is there anybody in here who has not heard of containers or Docker? Now I just shamed you all. Somebody back there is like, oh man, I am so behind the times. No, it's okay, it's all right. Um, yes, it seems like it's everywhere. It seems like all people are talking about. Is there anyone out there who really understands containers? Or Docker. Yeah, the, okay, you, you got a little of this. We got, a, we got a hand over here. Was that Rob that put his hand up? Yeah, I, I believe him. You, 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 you got it? All right, well, you know, there's food out there. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, yeah, so, uh, so that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about containers, and it's taken me a long time to get my head around it, too. And I gotta admit to you guys, I didn't get it. I didn't see the point. I mean, we've already got VMware. We've got virtualization. What do we need something else just like that, but not like that for? Like, what's the point? And the pitch that I kept getting from nerds 
was, oh, but containers are so more efficient because they don't have a hypervisor and they don't waste memory and CPU cycles. And I'm like, blah, blah, blah. I have so much memory. My memory is huge. And I don't have to worry about wasting memory, OK? CPU cycles, I got no problem. Got no problems with CPU cycles. But seriously, today's I mean, Intel makes a 24-core Xeon, OK? We don't have to worry as much about the CPU overhead of running six operating systems instead of one operating system, OK? That's not the thing. That's not the deal with containers. So let's just set that aside. Containers are not about efficiency. They're not about packing more into the same thing that you could run VMware. They're not even a replacement for VMware. It has nothing to do with VMware. It happens to do something like that, but that's not what it's about. And it took me a long time to realize this. And once I realized this, I said, oh, OK, so maybe there is something here. Maybe there is something interesting. So what is a container? For one thing, it's a rare case where a, um, an industry BS term actually makes some sense. Right? I mean, uh, uh, unlike cloud, for example, which makes no freaking sense at all, container actually makes some sense. What is a container? It contains things. Right? And not only that, but it keeps things contained. This is exactly what a container does. Um, essentially, essentially, it is an instance of the operating system, an instance of the user space of the operating system, where you can run something in a very contained, enclosed, constrained environment. And you can run multiple of those if you want to. But you don't have to. You can just run one. And you can scale them out across multiple physical hosts if you want to. But you don't have to. You can just run it on one thing. And it still works. And I'm going to dive in quite a lot of detail into what exactly this means and how exactly this works. But I want you to, um, does this thing have a thing? I do. Oh, it does. I want you to just, just remember this. OK, so we've got the operating system sitting here. And on top of the operating system, we have these lovely shipping containers. And the shipping container contains three things. It contains libraries, like on, you know, on Windows, it'll be like DLLs and stuff like that. On Unix, you know, there's similar kind of libraries. Um, you know, it contains utilities, like commands. And it contains an application. And when I say application, in many cases, it's not an application. In many cases, it's an executable. It's, it's a part of an application. But we'll get to that, too. And each of these has solid corrugated steel walls around it to keep it from escaping. But not only to keep it from escaping, but also so that we can move it around, so that we can know what's in there. Right? Once you close up one of those shipping containers and you put it on the boat from China, hopefully, you're not going to open it up and find something totally different in there. Oh my gosh, where did these monkeys come from? Um, hopefully, you're going to open it up, and there's the car that you shipped. right? That's kind of how these things work. And that, that's the deal with containers. How many problems in IT are caused by an application running in a surprise environment of, and full of monkeys? Right? I mean, all of our data centers are full of monkeys, you know? And you open it up, and you look at it, and you're like, whoa, no wonder this application didn't work. Look at all this other stuff that's running here, you know? Look at all this. Oh my gosh, this is totally out of date. Oh man, this was never intended to work with this driver or with this, you know, this totally different utilities or this different environment, you know? Oh, well, we use Red Hat, and this thing was designed in Ubuntu, and I, I don't, why doesn't it work, right? That's why it doesn't work, because it was never intended to run that way. That's the deal with containers. Because containers give us a predictable environment to run applications in, a predictable, constrained environment. So the developer can make an application or an executable or an application component and know exactly what the surrounding parts are going to be. And that's very, very cool. And it's not just cool for developers. I recently wrote about this on my blog. And um, the only thing I wrote about, I just decided, forget it. The only thing I'm going to write about is how cool it is for IT to not have to worry so much about patch levels and revisions and operating system versions and all this stuff that we deal with. 
Because most of our problems are not really, oh, this application totally doesn't work, right? Most of our problems are, I'm totally running this wrong, right? I'm trying to do something, I'm trying to run it in an environment it was never meant to run it. The other day, um, I wanted to try something out, and the documentation was all about how to run it in Ubuntu. And uh, I use a Mac. And um, I have an Ubuntu machine running in the cloud. But rather than bothering connecting to the Wi-Fi and running it and connecting over SSH and trying it over there, I started up Docker. I ran my Ubuntu image. I messed around with it. And I killed it. And I ran it on a Mac. And in this case, it was running in a virtual machine. But how cool is that, that I could just instantly, with like two commands on the command line, have my Ubuntu environment running here, and then just tear it down and be done with it, and not have to worry about you know, installing it and you know, running all this heavy duty stuff. Very easy, very simple. And that's what the deal with containers are. So it's basically virtualization, but at the operating system level. There's no hypervisor involved, necessarily. But it doesn't preclude a hypervisor. In my case, with my Mac, when you run Docker on a Mac, it actually does run VirtualBox as a hypervisor, and everything runs in VirtualBox. But you don't see it, you don't know it, you didn't install it, you don't touch it, it just does its thing. And suddenly I'm running Linux applications on my Mac. And that's kind of neat. So let's dive in a little deep. Let's talk about the operating system stack. This is important to understand containers and understand how this stuff works. So essentially, classical operating systems have two worlds. We've got the system space and we've got the user space. And most of us are vaguely familiar with these things. We're vaguely familiar with like ring zero or protected mode or things like that, right? We've kind of, you know, we kind of run into these things. Essentially what we've got is we've got an operating system, a kernel, that hits the hardware, runs the device drivers, does all the hard stuff, translating hardware into software. And then we've got a user space. And the user space is everything we touch, everything we interact with. You never touch the kernel. Every interaction with the kernel is done through system calls. That's on purpose, because imagine if as a user, you are allowed to just really muck around with the internals. It would be like back in the 8-bit computer days. Remember when you could just uh, do all sorts of cool stuff with your uh, Atari or Apple or whatever, right? I mean, you could, uh, you could definitely mess around with the hardware there. You can't do that anymore. Everything you do happens in user space, in protected mode, whatever you're going to call it, away from the kernel. And this is important to understand because this is what's going on when we talk about containers. Essentially. A container is a duplicate user space. You take everything that's not the kernel, everything that's not in system space, and you create another one. And it's a special one that only that container can see. And you can run more than one of those things in many operating systems. Many kernels allow you to run multiple user spaces. You guys remember all the controversy about GNU Linux? You remember when Linux came out and then that free software dude, Stallman, started saying, no, 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 it should be called GNU Linux because it uses the GNU system. That's more important than the Linux part. Linux is the kernel. That's all Linux is. It's the kernel. It's the part you don't touch. Everything you interact with is third party. Turns out somebody did a, a, a code audit. An average end user Linux distribution Linux only makes up, I think, 12% of the lines of code that you're using. The GNU utilities make up, I think, 16% of what you use. And other software makes up the rest. So only about, let's say, 12% of the computer is the kernel. The rest of it is stuff you're running on the kernel, is user space. And we've encountered this concept before. Remember Citrix, right? Citrix was before, it was, it was not virtualized. It was not hypervisored. How did Citrix work? How did WinFrame work? When you logged into that terminal server in Microsoft Windows, how did that work? It worked the same way containers work. It worked by creating a separate user space, essentially. Now, it, let me just put a flag up. It wasn't exactly the same thing. This guy's like, yeah, totally, I know that. Um, it, it wasn't exactly the same thing, but it pretty much the same thing. You're pretty much creating a separate user space running on the same kernel. And so each of us 
encounters it as if it's our own computer, but it's totally not. And it's not a virtual machine either. There's not, you don't have your own operating system. You don't have your own kernel. You have an environment that you're using. And that's what's going on here with, um, with containers. In Linux, back um, in the early part of the 2000s, there was a project that came out of Google called Control Groups or C Groups. C Groups was a way to segment user space on the Linux kernel, essentially to say that the Linux kernel could support multiple user spaces. And that led to the development of modern Linux containers and Docker directly. That's, that's the path. So here's the history. Containers really came about way, way back in Unix version 7 in 1979. Seriously. That's when this technology came about first. You know what else came out in Unix version 7? Tar, awk, I mean, born shell, right? That's how old containers are. Containers are literally as old as the born shell. And at the time, the idea was that we would use it as sort of a proof of concept or maybe as security. Um, it became used in the 80s and early 90s as honeypots. You know, basically, I, you're going to run an untrusted application. So I'm going to create what, what was then jokingly termed a jail, which was basically a fake environment that the application could run in. And, it, and it, to the application, it looked like it was running, it had the whole system. It had you know, the root file system and every file below it, all the utilities, everything were running. But it really wasn't. It was really just a ch root jail. And that way, you could see what this application is going to do. That's where containers came from. Um, this was implemented in uh, FreeBSD as jails. That's literally the term that they used. Uh, back in the 2000 time frame, um, there was a Linux commercial one, a couple of commercial Linux ones that, that did similar things. Solaris, HPUX, AIX, all had containers. Eventually, in 2008, we had a nice standardized C groups based container system for Linux called LXC. And then can you believe Docker's only three years old? Totally true. The, the thing didn't even invent, in, exist three years ago. So this is really where we're at today. Essentially, every Unix operating system has containers. Windows has terminal services, which is similar to containers. And as of now, as of the new version of Windows that was introduced just this month, um, Windows has support for native containers as well, uh, which is totally fantastic, as we're going to talk about at the end. Um, but Docker, Docker's where it's at. Frankly, it's all about Docker. And I'm going to sound like a Docker advertisement, but don't worry, I'm going to cut them off at the knees, too. Um, why is Docker so cool, right? Because as you can see, like Docker is only the newest container. It's not even the most used container, you know? <laughs> It's just another container. So why is Docker so cool? What do we care about Docker? This is why we care about Docker. Number one, Docker did it, well, essentially Docker did it right. How did they do it right? Number one, they created something that was super, super, super simple for non-IT operations nerds. They created something that was so simple and so compelling to use. I kid you not, if you folks install this, I can, I can tweet you how to get it up and running, OK? It's that easy. And by making it that easy, these other things, not easy. Who's used FreeBSD jails? I hate FreeBSD jails. They're such a pain. They're so wonderful, but they're such a pain to use, right? Docker is the exact opposite. It's not wonderful. <laughs> it's only moderately good. But it's so easy to use that it's the only thing that matters. Essentially, they took this technology that existed and they made it great. They made it great because it's so developer focused. It's extensible, it's open, there's APIs, developers love using it. Suddenly, this whole ecosystem sprang up around automating Docker containers. Even though all these developers had been using LXC containers for years beforehand, they all just jumped on Docker because it's so great. Another great thing Docker did was create an app store. One of the coolest things about Docker, the reason that I can tweet you how to use Docker, is because you can literally say, Docker, run Ubuntu. <laughs> and when you do that, it says, what the heck is Ubuntu? Oh, I'll go look in the app store. Oh, there it is. I'll download that. Oh, here it is. Now I've got it. Oh, I'm going to run it. 
And in that one, one, one liner, suddenly it's all running. There's basically an open app store. Now, it's not an app store because you can't buy stuff from it yet. You will. That's their path to profitability. But right now, essentially, it's an open app store, a free app store. And you can download stuff. And not only that, but you can contribute stuff. If you say Docker run, now this doesn't work, so don't worry. Sfosket slash operation overthruster, right? It would download my from my repository and run that on your machine. That's pretty cool, right? I can publish something, and uh, you know my friend Nigel um, does uh, Pluralsight courses, fantastic Pluralsight courses on Docker, really fantastic. Um, you got to uh, check out Nigel Poulton's uh, courses if you're interested in this stuff. Um, as part of his courses, that's what he does. He says, you know, go, you know, run this this pre-made Docker image here, you know, and and all you have to do is like literally type one liner and it comes down. Fantastic. Um, another thing Docker did that I totally hate is they made their own storage layer. And I'm gonna talk about that in great detail in a minute, but essentially it optimizes capacity, it optimizes startup, and it makes it really easy to store container images and inflate them into containers. Um, they've lately embraced extensibility. Um, this is one of the things that a lot of people say, oh, Docker's so amazing because you can plug in a new storage driver, plug in a new network driver. Um, Point of order, you couldn't do that until recently. That was not where they were going, but they decided to go there. And now that they've gone there, you can totally plug in anything you want. Docker can even run LXC containers. You know, I mean, you can, you can do some, some pretty cool things in terms of openness. Um, and the other thing that Docker has done, and this is pretty savvy, even though their competitors wouldn't think so, is they basically are in co-opetition with the entire ecosystem. And whenever the ecosystem comes up with something awesome, Docker tries to do it easier and more integrated. And Swarm is probably the greatest example of that, where they essentially they saw what people were doing with containers and they just said, cool, and made something that was 80% functionality and 5,000 times easier to use, and away they went. So, so that's why we're going to talk about Docker. So literally, the rest of the day, I'm going to talk about Docker for this reason. Because really, it's like VMware. I used to do seminars on virtualization, and there was always that guy who'd be like, well, what about you know, Solaris virtualization? What about Oracle virtual machine? You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm not even talking about that. Because for everybody else in the room, that doesn't matter. So I'm going to talk about Docker. So how does Docker work? As I said, um, the cool thing about Docker is you got this hub, this, this, this app store. And essentially, you grab an image from the App Store automatically. You don't have to grab it. Docker just does it, right? You just say, hey, I want to run Ubuntu. There it is. Um, and then that image essentially is an inflatable container. Think of it that way. Think of it like a pool toy. Imagine how much fun your kids could have at the pool with an inflatable container. Oh, Dad, it's a shipping container. I'm so happy, right? Um, Essentially, that's what the image is. So you, you, you run Docker, you ask it to download the image, and it inflates into a container. And these are the essential terms you need to know. You need to know image, you need to know container. Image, like I said, image is a file system and a set of configuration for that file system. And then the container is the thing that's actually running. And you can take an image and you can run multiple containers out of it. You can have 50, 100, 1,000 container instances based on the same image. And each one is its unique animal, but each one is also exactly identical to each other one until you run anything in it, until you configure it, until you pop it up. So Docker proposes not using these containers the way containers had been used. Originally, they had been used as basically a full system. In those ch root jails and so on, what you did was you literally you ran like all of Linux in there, or all of Solaris, or all of Unix v7, whatever, um, so that the application would have everything it could possibly need, and would never know that it was running in jail. Like it's a gilded cage. A, contain a Docker image is not a gilded cage. Docker's best practice is to run it in the most simple way possible so that you only install the bare, bare minimum of libraries. Here's an example. That Docker Ubuntu image that you download as a default doesn't include ping. Why? 
because it doesn't need ping, you know? That's not a useful tool for whatever application. If you need it, you can install it, you can run it. It doesn't include anything, it doesn't include NFS. It doesn't include all these other system tools that you're used to. It doesn't even have to include a shell. Can you imagine that, running a Unix system without a shell? Well, you don't have to. If you don't need it, why bother? It's just a security risk, it's just bloat. That's what I mean about the simplest possible image, and that's what Docker promotes, is to, is to use the simplest possible image. Only the libraries you need. They also propose minimizing the number of layers of storage, and I'm gonna talk about storage layers in a second. Um, the other thing that Docker proposes is, again, contrary to how people used FreeBSD jails in particular, is only run one application. And in the case of Linux, that's usually a single process. Literally, you do ps-a, and it returns one process. And that is the process that you're running in that container, right? So I'm, I'm running a database engine, right? I do a ps, one line, database engine, that's it because everything else is superfluous. And that is pretty cool, that is pretty cool. On Windows, not so much. You, do, you check out the Windows processes and there's a lot, lot more running in there. Um, the other idea, and this is where people have taken this, is that what you do then, so you run one, one executable per, per container and then you run multiple containers per application. So let's say you're running, I don't know, a search engine that indexes the entire web, just to pull something that I just invented right now, okay? You could have crawlers as an application running in container, and you could run that five million times, <laughs> right? You could have indexers as an application running in a container, and you could run that five million times. You could have, I don't know, the web server that you query you know, Google, whatever, oh, I gave it away. Um, and you could run that 500 million times. That's the container philosophy. That's how the containers scale. And um, Apple, not known for their uh, openness about how they do stuff, recently uh, went to a, uh, a meetup and explained how Siri works. And it seems that every time I hit the Siri button on my iPhone, it spins up, Apple's not using Docker, they're using Mesos. It, you, it actually starts a container in the cloud for your exact individual transaction, handles what you're doing, and then tears it down and destroys it immediately afterwards. How cool is that, right? That's, that's, the, that's the cool thing about containers. You can't do that. Can you imagine cloning and starting a virtual machine in the time that it takes you to hit the Siri button? No way, but, it can, but with containers, that's literally how it's happening. That's pretty neat. And that's how basically every web scale application works. Twitter you know, is made up of a gazillion containers, each doing special tasks. So um, the other thing that, uh, that Docker says, and, and this reflects reality, is to put anything persistent and anything active in an external volume. So you don't store it internal to the container. And I'm gonna to talk to you about why in a second, because storage in Docker is bizarre. So let's, uh, let's move on. All right. So how do you build one of these things? Well, you can make a Docker file of your own. And your Docker file is actually pretty simple. It's a file that says basically three things. And you can literally, you, you don't have to base it on an existing one, even though it's easiest to do that. You have a basic image, like, okay, I want Ubuntu. And then you have a bunch of app installs, apt, get, install, ping, okay? And then you run a command, ping, right? There, I've just written a Docker file. And when I run it against that, doc when I run Docker against that Docker file, it does all that stuff and magically works. That's pretty cool, right? And now you can see why developers like this. Because they're like, oh man, I need a, uh, I need a key value store, you know? And so they'll just literally, with three or four or five lines, create a container that runs only a key value store application, an open source application, and then run it. And then they'll run it five million times because they need to scale it. You know, that's pretty cool. Um, you can also use a thing called Docker Compose, which actually it allows you to create 
um, multiple container images. So you can say, um, for example, one of the easiest ones is um, there's a Docker Compose image that they use as their sample that runs a container with WordPress and a web server and a container with MySQL. <laughs> and in Docker Compose, those are all enclosed. And all you have to do is say Docker Compose run my magical WordPress thing. And you've got two containers running. One is the database server. One is the web server. You've got WordPress running. And it's like a one-liner. So that's, that's pretty neat. So that's how, that's how you start this stuff. That's how you do this stuff. But let's look under the hood. I talked about layered storage before. Before I put this up, I want to remind you, what is the data? See the DeltaWare logo? What does the DeltaWare logo look like? It looks like that. I think DeltaWare is actually layered storage. Um, so one of the cool things that Docker did, as I mentioned earlier, is, is, is this idea of layered storage. And I'm a storage nerd. That's my specialty. This is bizarre stuff, OK? So let me explain how it works. Essentially, you've got, imagine instead of using PowerPoint and this thing, I was like an, your old science teacher, and I had transparencies that I had written by hand with a magic marker. Is, is anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah, I made you all say you're old. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, I'm old enough to remember that too. So there we go. All right. So imagine you've got one of those transparencies, and I lay it down, and I put down a transparency, and it is the Linux standard file system with utilities and with directories and with proc and Etsy and all this stuff. OK. That's the bottom layer. Now I take another transparency, and I lay it down. And that is some utilities that I installed on top of that basic Linux image. Maybe it's got a web server. Maybe it's got some standard web libraries, something like that. That's the next layer. Now let's say I lay down another one. And it has maybe some data. Maybe it's the WordPress install. And now I lay down another one that's blank. And I run it. That's how Docker storage works. And everything you do in a container is written on that top layer. So if I write a file, if I edit Etsy hosts, if I edit a HTML file, whatever, it's written on that top transparency layer. And if I pull that transparency layer off, it's gone. That's why Docker is not, that's why they say that the storage is not persistent. Because that top layer is unique to this particular container. Remember the difference between a container and an image. A container is running. It's a thing that's running. The image is everything below that top transparency layer. So that's why I can take an image and run it 50 times or 100 times and not have to worry about them corrupting each other or changing data or whatever because it's this kind of transparency system because all the changes, all the writes are pulled up to that top layer. If I edit a file that exists down below, it'll actually search layer by layer until it finds the original file. It'll copy it to the top layer and then it'll edit it there. And this is critical to understanding how Docker works and why it's cool. Because what that means is that you can, you can literally grab that same Ubuntu image, you can run it 50 times, you can do all sorts of stuff in it, you can change it, you can do whatever you want. And as soon as you shut it down and remove it, that's gone, but the image is still there and you can run it again and do something else different with it. Very different from how a virtual machine works. A virtual machine, like a VMDK, has everything written in it and it's, it's a file that's just a fake hard drive. This is totally different. And this was one of Docker's unique contributions. Now, they didn't invent this. They did invent the, impl the implementation of this, this AUFS file system layer. But they did not invent the concept of a union file system. What essentially is, in, in, in storage terms, this is a union mount file system. And a union mount has existed before as well. And it is exactly what I've just described. What Docker did is they invented a specific implementation of that for use by containers. And because of this, this kind of in, informs you of how everything else in Docker works. Because this is how they assume that everything always should work. Now, one of the nice things about this is that it's low, low storage requirements. You can run 1,000 containers, and if they're not changing much data, they literally take the capacity of one image. 
you know? I mean, I think, the, um, I think the size of each layer, of an empty layer is, I think, like 12 bytes or something stupid like that. I mean, it's, it's like nothing. It doesn't matter. Um, unless they've started to write and read data, and then it becomes, you know, bigger. Um, Another thing this gives you, like I said, is the ability to create your own containers. Remember when I was talking about Docker files, I said you base it on an existing image and then you install some utilities? That's creating a layer. And so one of the cool things they added recently is what they're calling content addressable storage, which I object to because that was already a term in the, in the storage industry that means something different. But for Docker, what it means is they actually run a simple cryptographic hash against each of those layers. So you take the transparency and you run a cryptographic hash against it and you come out with a unique key that represents that data and uniquely represents that data and allows you to check that for sure that it's that data. And so the next time I run a virtual machine that uses the same Ubuntu layer, I don't have to download it again because it knows I already have it and I can use that layer with a different image. So pretty soon you've got this whole weird overlapping set of these transparencies. As storage people, we can see problems here. So this optimizes for capacity and it optimizes for a fast start. Because again, whenever you start this, you're not copying a bunch of data, you're not cloning a bunch of data, you literally have the same starting point. It's like a gold master. The problem is that we're concentrating I.O. And unfortunately, by default, Docker stores these things in the root file system, which is typically a hard drive. And so we're concentrating the running of literally perhaps hundreds of images on a single spot on a single hard drive. That's really, really bad. Of course, you can change this. You can store them somewhere else. You can store them somewhere smart, like on an SSD. But by default, that's not what you're doing. By default, all of the I.O. for every container is concentrated on these same like, you know, sectors on the same hard drive. Um, so there's that. They're not storage people. Um, now, there's a few different options for storage. As I mentioned, uh, Docker started out with this thing, AUFS, which was basically their own union file system driver. Um, the Linux people didn't accept it. And so, who was it? Was it Oracle? I don't know. There, there was a company um, that was interested in using this, and they said, you know, we've got another union file system that we could use, OverlayFS. And so Docker has pretty much switched to Overlay, actually Overlay 2 now, um, which has been further refined. Um, and essentially, it works exactly as I've described with the layers, with the DeltaWare logo um, <laughs> as the storage layer. Now, other people said, you know, this looks a lot like snapshots, because it's basically, it's all based on copy on write, which is a, 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 another storage technology that we've been using for a long time. They said, this looks a lot like snapshots and clones on a copy on write system, on a NetApp or ZFS, or even the, the LVM, Linux LVM, does the same thing. And so you've also got a bunch of snapshot-based approaches. Um, Device Mapper literally maps those layers into clones on the, uh, in LVM. Um, ZFS, which is probably the best file system in existence right now, unfortunately, says how bad storage industry is, um, also uses snapshots and clones that can be integrated directly into Docker. ButterFS, which is a new file system in Linux, also can do this. So essentially we can do this in a way that's much more scalable and potentially eliminates my hotspot concern. You can also just say, forget it, I'm gonna run a totally different storage driver, and Docker will take that too. Um, but the problem with all this is that essentially what we're doing is we're, we're, we're storing, we're running applications and we're storing data on something that is not intended to be persistent. Because Docker storage is not persistent. If I remove that container, remember I wipe off that top image, and I lose everything that it's written, as long as it was running. And that's really bad if I had something of value there, right? If it's a totally stateless application component, it's not so bad. If it's my web crawler, it's not so bad because everything that it does, it's gonna write out to some external database and that's fine. But 
if we don't want to do that, if we want to have some kind of persistent storage, Docker recommends using what's called a data volume, which is a horribly nonspecific term. But that's really what they call it, a data volume. And what a data volume is, is essentially it's another thing in the file system. And it maps an external location, like let's say slash mount slash emc3, right, to an internal location inside the container, slash mount slash you know, my data, whatever. And you can even do this with individual files, which is totally nuts, don't do it. Um, but you can do it with a directory. You know, you could say, oh, I want everybody to be able to access the same var www data, right? Because they're all web servers, I want them all to be accessing, reading and writing the same data file. And that's easy. It's just a one-liner flag on the Docker command line. and. Um, the nice thing here is that it's, it doesn't have to go through all those layers. It doesn't have all this copy on write and data drivers and all this stuff. The other nice thing is that it's persistent because I can blow away that container. I can start another container, give it the same data volume, and it'll be mounted in the same spot, and it can run there too. I can also have this data volume exist on an external storage system, which I love. So there's that. Um, Docker also has something they call a data volume container. <laughs> which is essentially doing what I've just described and then sharing the data from that container to other containers. So it basically makes a container file server, which is kind of like, whoa, that's kind of weird. But it does, it works. And this is another way to share data. And this is essentially how they say to deal with storage. But in my opinion, this is not a good solution. So I'm looking forward to hearing more from companies about how they're going to solve the, the container storage issue. Um, we also have, um, as I mentioned, the issue of persistence. Again, Docker says things aren't persistent. These are not pets. These are cattle. You know, we have a herd of them. We don't care about individual ones. They don't have names. We just run them, and then we kill them and eat them, right? They're cattle. Um, and so we don't have to worry about that. Um, they also intentionally don't allow you to have any kind of container mobility. You can't move a container from one host to another. That's on purpose because they don't want you to do that. They want you to kill it and start another one or 50 of them. So it's kind of a weird situation because as long as you don't remove the container, it is persistent. That top layer still exists and you can stop and restart it and so on and your data is still there. Just know that that's not supposed to be how you're, you're not supposed to use it that way. <laughs> and that could cause problems in, in the future. So let's talk about networking for a second. By the way, how much time do I have? Am I out of time? Uh, you got about four minutes. Excellent. I can do that. All right. So let's talk about networking. Um, just like storage is kind of boneheaded in Docker, networking is boneheaded too. Um, by default, it just has a very, very simple bridge network. Uh, between hosts, and, and, and that is not satisfactory. Um, essentially, when you start up a container, it gives it an IP address in the 172 range, and that is an internal only IP address, and there's no external connectivity. So how do you do external connectivity? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, how do you uh, have containers talk to each other? Well, that's built in. Essentially, all of them share a bridge inside the host, but not outside the host. For that, you have to create what's called an overlay network. Um, originally, Docker had this horrible idea of creating something called a key value store to pass data over a fake network. Um, and network people just said, oh, kill me now. But lately, Docker has created a, a real VXLAN-based overlay network, which is much, much better. Um, or, just like storage, you can just wipe it away and plug in any old network. And so most networking companies now have a complete network plugin that replaces the entire network infrastructure <coughs> for Docker, which is kind of cool. Um, you can also do external networking. By default, you can map ports. So if you've got a web server running in a, in a, in a container, you can map like port 80 to port 80 on the host. And that way, whenever anybody talks to your host, they actually are talking to the container. So you can kind of see where, to, where they were going with this and why they developed it and why developers loved it so much. You can also route the entire network from inside to outside. So this is essentially what you need to know. This is literally how Docker works. Um, as I mentioned, they also created this thing called swarm mode. This is the new cool thing. Um, for a while, there were applications called uh, Kubernetes that came out of Google, uh, Mesos that is part of the Apache Foundation, uh, that essentially allow you to manage many, many containers running on many different hosts all over the place. Um, 
Docker sat there and watched that happen for a long time. They watched open source projects. And then they said, OK, we're going to integrate our own. And it's called swarm mode. And just like the difference between Docker and every other containers is that Docker is like a one-liner and it's super easy to use, same with swarm mode. With swarm, it literally is like a two-liner <laughs> to create a managed, scalable cluster of containers. And it's totally amazing. High availability is a flag. I want to have five running at all times. That's the flag. And then when you like literally unplug a host, it restarts all those containers on a different host in the cluster. And it just takes care of that for you. It's pretty freaking amazing. Um, the other thing that Swarm Mode includes is real overlay networking. And it's secure by default, which I totally love. So essentially, all the hosts in the Swarm c c communicate over an encrypted tunneled network of their own. And just by being a member of the swarm, they become a member of the network. And they can all have secure inner node communications, even if they're located in different places. Like even if one of them is on your laptop, another one's in your data center, and another one's on Amazon, they're all in a same secure network, which is pretty freaking neat. And again, if you've got the swarm mode running with a whole bunch of different instances, you close your laptop. <laughs> it starts up more instances maybe in the cloud or somewhere else to take up for the ones that just died. So that's pretty awesome. And it's all just like one-liner kind of thing. So, so this, is, this is why Docker's cool. And this is why everybody's excited about it. And this is why every company wants to work with them. And why every product is starting to work with them. So what are we going to do with containers? Well, the easy answer is the consistency answer. This is why I was initially excited. I was excited because as a Unix admin, I can grab a container image and not have to futz around with all this stuff, right? I, uh, I recently was trying to run uh, Homebridge uh, at my house, which allows you to use uh, Google Nest with Apple HomeKit, which is not supposed to be possible. Homebridge makes it possible, right? It's a pain in the, it's horrible to configure, right? But there's a container version of it. And that is a one-liner. And it's like, hallelujah. That's why containers are cool right there. Imagine the future of application deployment when this is how we install third-party applications. Can you imagine if Oracle got wise and distributed Oracle in a container or, a, or, or a, a compose a whole bunch of containers and suddenly you didn't have to worry about anything, it just sort of ran? Maybe you could even just type a command and it ran. That would be so amazing. And boy, would you pay for licenses. Um, <laughs> So there's that. That's awesome. There's also a security aspect. Now, don't overblow the security aspect here. No, um, Docker is still uh, potentially very insecure. There can still be all sorts of security issues. But there are some benefits here. I mean, think about what, what, what is the most common security problem. It's the same as the most common configuration problem. It's all that other stuff. right? Imagine if my web server has, I don't know, some kind of escalation of privilege. right? That's not a problem if the only process that was running is the web server process. But the problem comes when you do that escalation of privilege, and then you use that to run some other unrelated process. That's where the issue is, right? Oh, I escalated my privileges here, and I'm going to export the entire uh, Active Directory <laughs> and then send it out to uh, China, right? That's the problem. Imagine running that web server in a container. There's no Active Directory. There's no export. There's no China, right? So there is a security angle here, and it's a good security angle. But again, don't get too excited about it, because of course, there are still things you can do. And there are still ways that you can get around this, because of course, it's networked, and there's other utilities, and so on. But from that angle, I really like it. There's, there's some pretty cool things. Um, another thing that we can get excited about is scalable applications. Every company in the enterprise IT space that has you know, kind of up-to-date with it developers is looking at Docker as a way to build, to rebuild their application. I was talking to a storage array company recently. And remember what I was saying about Google, right? You've got the indexers as containers. You've got the analyzers as containers. You've got the web servers as containers. Imagine a storage array that has the iSCSI target as a container, a scalable container. Imagine the deduplication is a scalable container. The compression is a scalable. The encryption, the RAID, all of that, the GUI, all of that are just, are just processes running in containers. There are literally multiple companies inventing that right now. 
as storage arrays. Same thing with network services, same thing with application servers, databases. Microsoft is reinventing Windows that way right now. This is pretty cool. Imagine escaping the bounds of a single host. Suddenly you don't have to, you, you know, maybe you've got six servers and they're all running Exchange. And they're not running, you know, a different instance of Exchange. They're all running one scalable multi-application instance of Exchange in containers, right? I don't know that that's what Microsoft is doing, but I bet it is because that's pretty cool and that's where they're going and that's where applications are going. And essentially, this is what we're going to see in the future. This is the, new, uh, the next application you're going to buy. It's going to be containerized for all these reasons. For contain, you know, uh, contained configuration, for security, for scalability, for ease of deployment. They're all going to be containerized. And even though Docker originally appealed mainly to developers, and even though people still like to say, oh, Docker, that's for DevOps, it's not. It's for everybody because these benefits aren't really DevOps benefits. These are ops benefits. These are things that we love, things that I love. I don't like fighting with Unix systems. I don't like fighting with incompatibilities and the wrong version of a library and updating systems and all that kind of stuff. I don't like installing applications. That's why it matters to us. And that's why Docker isn't just a DevOps thing. And that's why Docker has taken off. And that's why I had what I had to say this morning. So there we go. So thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry if I went a couple minutes over, but I, I enjoyed that very much. And it's always great to be here with Deltaware.